So let me go ahead and get started. Hi, my name is Jason Kreidner. I work at Texas Instruments. Uh, I'm one of the guys that was involved in launching the BeagleBoard project. Um, you know, I like to, now that it's a great success, I like to claim it was my idea. <laughs> um, it's a, I, I didn't design it. Gerald Coley is the guy that designed it. I didn't bring up the kernel and the boot loader. That was between Kasim and, um, and Steve Kippish. Kasim Syed Mohammed and Steve Kippish. I, I didn't do most of the things, but um, I, I do run the, the website. I do, uh, I'm, I'm the community interface guy. Um, so if you, if, you, if you have questions about the way the BeagleBoard project is run, if you have um, any doubts, um, Blame me, you know. I think that the, the the developers did a great job, and we can't blame them for for, for anything that's missing. If, it, if something's missing, or you're not happy with something, um, that is, that's me, right? The plane department. Um, so I've I've been playing around with uh, Linux since '92, but um, largely largely playing. Um, I'm not a I'm not a kernel hacker. Um, I have done a little bit of driver development, but uh, it'd be embarrassing to show you. Um, I, don't, I don't think I have any upstream patches. Um, I, I just really believe in the open source um, development methodology um, and, and the opportunity it gives for, for people to, to learn about the technology. Right? Linus started out as a self-education project, and uh, I think that the, with the opportunity that gives others to do self-education um, is really critical. And that was a big part of, the, of, of Beagle Board. I wanted to do Beagle Board for my own interests. Um, and it turns out that it's a, a lot of other people were, were pretty interested in it too. So what I'm going to talk to you here today is about using probably the most popular development platform that there is today, you know, high schoolers. Um, et cetera, are, are developing for the web, right? They're, they're, they're writing HTML plus JavaScript plus CSS applications. And I want to try to figure out how to get those people interested in embedded Linux and capable of utilizing embedded Linux devices, you know, starting with something, something like a Beagle board. Um, so if your teenage children today are, are you know, hacking up uh, websites and you know, presenting those out, then you know, this might be something really appropriate for them. And, I, and I'm really interested in other people interested in collaborating on, on building a toolkit um, to get those people started with embedded Linux. Um, so in, in um, 2008, we launched the Beagle Board. Um, and I think what was really different of, of, about it um, was that it's, it's an embedded platform, but it's full distribution Linux, right? It blends the um, the, the desktop world um, with the embedded world, right? It looks like an, um, a desktop, right? You hook a monitor to it, you hook up a keyboard and mouse, um, you run Ubuntu on it, and... Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> because you've heard of it. I've Maybe heard of Windows, 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 Windows. Windows. Who, um, who has heard of Angstrom in this room? Ah, oh, nice! <laughs> We'll be running Angstrom today. <laughs> so, so okay. Um, so when you're you're running Angstrom and you want to run it as if um, a real desktop environment, this gives you a fantastic platform to do so. Um, you know, it's low power, um, affordable, and it's pretty small. This is one, right? So this is a BeagleBoard XM. So it's running off of the USB, off of the laptop, and um, you know, this is uh, $150. If you get the one without the, the extra USB ports, runs a little bit slower. It's uh, $125 in DigiKey. Um, adding more distributors all the time. Um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of getting everywhere. I think everybody can get a hold of it. If you notice that the stock is zero um, in DigiKey, buy, order it anyway because they're getting new boards every week. Um, if you get on the back order, you'll get it much, much quicker than if you don't order it. Um, there are coming, it shouldn't take you more than a couple weeks to get a board. Um, there's a there's a huge community. Um, the mailing list is only about uh, 3,500 people, 
but I know that there's a lot more people monitoring um, that just because when I put things into the, the BeagleBoard RSS feed, you know, um, there's, there's thousands of people that end up uh, fetching that URL. Um, and the, the most popular download is actually people have deep links into the system reference manual. Um, you know, I get a, around a thousand people coming to the, to the, web, the BeagleBoard website a day, um, you know, most of which are, are new people. And, um, and I get more than that downloading um, the system reference manual. Um, so I think a lot of people just forget that they haven't downloaded it. You know? um, and support in a lot of there's support in a lot of distros, right? So here you got really full distro Linux, not UC Linux, right? Tons of applications, browsers, um, word processors, all the things that that, that make Linux great, um, right? And what I'm going to show you is a zero install sort of visualization and editor tools um, that you can get to anywhere on the web and run them under two watts. All right. So this is this is a, a quick picture of it. You know, here's an editor. This is all running in Angstrom Linux on the on the Beagle board. I've got a, one browser window open where I'm doing my code editing from the browser. It could just as easily be located anywhere else because it's in a browser. Um, one window where a browser window where I'm running my application and displaying it, and you know it's it's embedded links under two watts. Um, the idea is that you can put this on on your board, um, you know, have your SD card image, and this is something that can just be shipped out to people. All they have to do is remote log into the board, and they can start editing code immediately. Zero install. So I think that's actually really critical for somebody who's. Um, you know this this high schooler sort of environment, right? They just really hasn't done a lot of coding before. If you have to in, do a whole bunch of tools installation, it's a huge barrier. You're not going to download 300 megabytes of tools that you might not ever touch, right? Um, so this is a, a, a zero install entry point. Um, and this was this was my entry point um, into. You know, computing and uh, and electronics, right? Uh, TRS-80s is where I started. And, and when I started with computers, you, you you play with computers. Well, you program them, right? And and so many so many kids are growing up today where a computer is uh, it, it's just a collection of applications that you run, right? They open up their web browser. Hey, everybody knows how to use a web browser, right? They open up their word processor. They do a spreadsheet, right? They're not programming. They're just using, and then they and they don't understand how the systems work, right? When you used to have the floppy disk that you put in, right? You know, it gave you a very concrete image of how the um, the computer worked. I think embedded systems, something like a big order, are making that tangible again. Right. As, so I think that as more and more people get into you know the Arduino crowd and stuff that are that are getting into electronics and bridging it, you know, it, this is an opportunity for them to really understand how it works, make computing tangible. All right. And with the little micro SD card that you put off the Beagle board, right? There's no um, on, on the XM version. There's no uh, non non volatile storage. So all the, the entire state is on the micro SD card. So if you want to let your kid, you know monkey around with all the software, go crazy, just take out the SD card pictures over here. Um, you know, if you want to put the board in a case so they don't damage it or something, you know, just tell them don't take a don't take a hammer to it and they're good, right? You don't have to worry about them messing with your configuration, right? It's entirely um, contained in the removable media. And and it was an environment for me where experimentation was encouraged, right? You you weren't worried about, well, you know, don't mess with the, the family computer, you're going to destroy all the photo albums, right? Well, by putting you know, something outside again, where you're, you're, you have this environment, right, you're, you're isolating them from that. And so here, the, again, the objective is to make the web programmable for all, right? And um, so what, what I've got is a, this thing called this Cloud9 IDE. It's an integrated development environment. Um, it, it spun out of the uh, Mozilla's uh, Bespin project, which became Skywriter. Um, uh, Bespin and Skywriter were both rendering in, cam in the HTML5 canvas. Um, well, they merged with um, Ajax.org's code editor, 
um, which actually renders in the DOM so it supports older browsers. Um, so this is an in-browser text editor. It's, it's really pretty full feature. It feels like you're in a, 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 a you know an Eclipse type of, of text editor. Um, one of these days I'm going to figure out how to do them bindings. Um, but you know, immediately just you're able to to to, to start typing typing code, and it's all in a browser. And this is an environment where you know kids and grandparents alike can really understand how to get started, right? You know, if you talk about you know running setup.exe on your Windows PC or you know downloading you know wget configure make, um, you know it's it's there's there's a there's a barrier to entry there. Um, so here, you know, a, a URL really is universal, right? That's all you need. That's that is your command line argument, right? Is uh, by the way, heckling in the in the middle of the presentation is perfectly acceptable. Um, please entertain yourselves. I'm sure you'll entertain the rest of us. Um, so if, if you if you if you have something you want to jump out and say that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of, just do it. Encouraging heckling is really a silly thing to do. Excellent. And pause. Um, and the, the editor eats its own dog food, right? They wrote this editor in JavaScript. So if you actually want to edit the editor, it's all in JavaScript. It's all open source. It's GPLv3 um, for, the, for the bulk of the editor. I think there's some GPLv2 portions, right? So this really is. Um, all open source and you know, it's written in the language, so it's JavaScript top to bottom. Does GPLv3 actually make sense for JavaScript? Does GPLv3 make sense for code written in JavaScript? Yeah, basically because you're not... Because you can get the source code anyway because you're it's... You're not linking to anything and you can hide it. Something like the AGPL might actually be better to protect things. Maybe so. Maybe the Inferno GPL might have been a better choice. Maybe it's even used in some places. Maybe something else. <laughs> um, but HTML provides a really quick and easy way to, to create a UI, right? Everybody can create a web page, you start making things clickable, and you've got a user interface. Can you add a Facebook like button? Facebook iPhone? Like button. Facebook. Does the editor have a Facebook like Can I like, like this line of code? Um, yeah, actually. I'm sure we can, well, if it doesn't, we can add it, right? So we'll just add this, add a like button. Is, is that something like blame? I mean, keep blame. Yeah. So there does have there is Git integration into the editor, and the, these guys have a, a website where you can do uh, Git you know uh, Git pulls and pushes off of their off of their um, commercial website. Um, and I'm sure a, a, at least a blame function would be trivial to add. You know, I, to me, blame is much more fun than like. So why JavaScript? Why JavaScript at all? Right. Well, the JavaScript language supports a, this idea of a closure, and it's actually a really handy thing for doing in, in embedded type stuff. And you know, maybe the JavaScript language isn't the fastest in the world. It's it's reasonably fast, but this is just a really convenient way to write code. Um, so I invoke the, this is um, um, read eval um, process loop, the read eval print loop um, for the JavaScript interpreter. And here I'm defining a function, assigning it to a variable, and in that function I'm returning another function. Right? So there's a local variable here within my function that's been referenced by uh, a nested function. And Okay, well, what's interesting about that? Well, if you think of this as, as you know, C, and when you return a, a pointer to a function, right, it doesn't have anything to do, like, if it, it's whatever global variables it's referencing, right, they better stick around. Um, and you have to think about that and manage that uh, in the scope of the rest of your application. But in JavaScript, it's going to maintain uh, that state information for those local variables. Um, for this function, and you can see that here by, by me um, declaring a, a function here by for a variable and assigning it, you know, by and an argument for 
um, assigns multiplier or equal to four, um, returns a function um, with that multiplier in it. Um, I could go back later and actually reassign that variable, but here I can make, make two functions and they each keep the state. All right? Would that be more elegant than scheme? <laughs> um, well, I think, isn't that where they got the idea from? Um, but this is, this is a nice C-like syntax, so, um, so we're but I like brackets. Bad programming practices early on. Bad programming practices early on. No, I think this is actually a really nice programming practice. <laughs> I think that actually might scare people off. It might scare people off to, yeah. to use a closure? <coughs> no, programming in general. I mean, it's just, it's just so... <coughs> It will, some people just will never like programming, so that's fine too. Um, but those that might, might prefer something that, that does a little bit of, of helping them along. And um, so the function reference isn't just a pointer, it keeps a copy of the local state, and then as you eliminate all the references, um, garbage collection comes on and screws up all your timing. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean helps you clean up all that code. But this is a really, we're still a really nice entry point, right? Certainly when you get into a real embedded system, you're going to have to be very conscious as to where garbage collection gets scheduled if you want it at all. But again, first order approximation. So what does Hello World look like in this, this JavaScript realm um, under this uh, Node.js, um, which is the, the, the interpreter I'm using here? Um, well, it's using, it's got a, a big collection of libraries, including ones for, for creating web servers and doing a lot of networking things that it's really, really focused on. Um, so if I want to create an HTTP server, it's real easy. Um, I pull in an HTTP module, HTTP module, and create server, and then I provide one of these closures um, where I define a function that I pass to create server that satisfies the need. So um, uh, you know, when I listen on this port, um, as people come in and, and, and make a request on that port, this function gets called, um, returning you know, content type text plane and hello world. So if I were to, to point a web browser, I don't know if you might actually let me show you. Show you this live, but, but trust me, this, this creates a, a, a web server and returns to any client the text hello world. Um, another way, you know, if you don't want to, to, to create a socket, you want to get another little simple sort of hello world that just prints hello world, right? I mean, it would be trivial to just say console log hello world, but this is a little bit more interesting. There's also these functions like uh, set timeout, right? Which again, utilizes a closure, a function um, that runs. Um, so here, um, this is a number of milliseconds, so two seconds later, it's going to run this function, right? And this is this is all the Node Node.js is all written to be non-blocking. Um, so you do this call this set not set set timeout function. You know what happens? Hello gets printed first. The program doesn't exit because it, it, there's an event loop that keeps track of stuff that's left to be done. So it doesn't exit until this set timeout uh, function. You know, its argument is run, so it prints hello, and then world. Um, so Node.js um, is, is common JavaScript, so they're working on standardizing a lot of the libraries for JavaScript. Um, it's one of the most compliant uh, interpreters out there today. It's using the V8 uh, JavaScript interpreter, which is the same one used in Chrome and in Android um, from, from Google. Um, the, the libraries are very focused on doing sort of networking applications, and there's a whole lot of them um, using the, the Node package manager. So GitHub is littered um, with open source applications written in, in Node.js. Um, pretty cool, lots of uh, um, web templating stuff and um, uh, the sort of stuff that you would expect to be in, in, in web servers, uh, but there's a lot of other stuff um, besides web servers, you can do with it. Uh, and for again, for embedded, what's really neat here is that it's event-based programming. So if you've got a whole bunch of little elements in your system generating events, you know, when does a network packet come in? Yes, obviously, that's what it's designed to deal with. But you know, when does a button press come in? When does audio data come in? When does all these other when do all these other things in the system, you know, asynchronously coming in? You know, how do I make that easy to manage without 
generating a bunch of you know understanding p threads, you know understanding you know how do I do threads in, in general, you know how do I hook interrupts, right? This is a, a pretty big hurdle um, to, to to overcome, and a lot of times you make mistakes. Here's a nice little simple way of just I've got this little JavaScript closure thing that allows me to satisfy um, these asynchronous events coming in. So even if something like a read file is an asynchronous event, what I do is I say, you know, create stream for reading a file, pass it a function pointer, that function, or pass it a function, that function is called as the data is read in. Um, and we'll see that in examples. Um, it turns out this is really, really fast. You know, comparing it to something like Apache, you know, C, C application, right? This approach is actually can handle many more um, concurrent um, open open connections um, than even you know a, a native C written application. That was your that was a cue by the way for the headquarters. It could be anyway. Too obvious. <laughs> um, <coughs> so now I want to 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 do some you know my. Everybody can read that in the back, right? No, maybe not. Um, uh, let's, let's do something with Linux, right? So if you want to interact with the Linux kernel, uh, you've got all the, the sysfs entries and the device nodes, right? You, your device drivers you know, expose the, the, the standard I.O. functions, right? Read, write, IOPL, unlink, right? That's the way you communicate to, to devices in your system. <coughs> well, can I do that from, from JavaScript? Um, yes, you can. Um, you can. Uh, what you do is you essentially create a, a listener, and then you open up the, the read stream, right? So here's here's my listener, um, where I'm doing binary parsing of events coming from a keyboard. Um, this is there's this binary library, binary parse, and giving the size of the different elements to be parsed out, um, and then. Just for, for visibility reasons, I was making it um, into a, a JSON uh, object and then passing that to the, to the, to the browser. Um, then I open up the file. This is dev input and then two. Um, sending the buffer size to 16, so it responds on every single event. Um, and then I plug the listener, right? So when data comes in over that, uh, it, 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 it sends it across the, the web socket. Pretty simple stuff, right? I mean, this, this to me, you know, you, you, you scale this across all the different um, sort of device nodes um, that are exposed by the Linux kernel and the drivers. This is something that gives an interface um, where just about anybody can understand. So if it's an SPI data stream, um, you know, if it's stuff coming in over a serial port, right? You just you just plug the functions, and you could you could broadcast to listeners so that you can have multiple functions listening. Um, it's, it's a really just a, a very um, flexible structure where I don't have to worry about you know catching interrupt vectors or um, you know well if I do a blocking read call then the rest of my application is going to be shut down unless I create a new thread right so here you don't have to do that right the event loop handles it for you um, you just provide the, the function callback and go along your merry way. Um, so the other part of this, so that's that's the, the sort of event capture side. Um, now, well, what can I do for, for rendering on the, um, the the visualization and display side? Um, and the Arduino guys, um, you know, try to make their little simple environment use this uh, processing language, which is really just Java um, and some some boilerplate stuff, um, and, and uh, just. You know, sort of a, a standard library. I think they, the Arduino guys call theirs uh, wiring um, instead of processing. Um, just a, I guess a play on the processing. I don't know. Um, but it's just you know, a, really just a set of libraries and, and standard Java code. Um, even though the, the Arduino guys are actually compiling with the C++ compiler, but it's, it's just a, a subset simplified syntax. Um, and for JavaScript. There's this processing JS language, which is really just, again, just it's just processing but implemented inside of, of JavaScript. And with the, the advent of the HTML5 canvas, 
right? So what's getting to be really prevalent in, in all the, uh, the browsers, I think IE is the only one sort of lagging behind. I think all the other browsers you know, have you know, uh, support for, for Canvas today. I think IE9 has it, who has IE9? Um, so processing JS utilizes the HTML5 Canvas and JavaScript to do the same thing as processing. Um, so there's a, a, just a, a you know, ton of applications, demos that you can use to, to figure out how to do visualization of your, um, you know, of your data. Um, again, it's not it's not focused on programmers. You know, if you if you, uh, I think that some of the stuff being done with QML and and uh, you know maybe there's some some better visualization libraries out there for the ultimate performance. Um, this is a nice, simple way to get started um, with very little learning. So what's Hello World look like in processing JS? Um, so there's, there's some setup stuff that you do. Here I'm just setting up my frame. It's, you know, again, um, there's just a lot of boilerplate stuff where I don't have to include a bunch of libraries. You set the size of the display. You set the frame rate, which you want it to be refreshed. Um, here I'm loading. Um, a, a font to, in order to do. And better is better. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then why does your shirt have Arial on it? <laughs> Not wearing that shirt today. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and and then there's just just this main draw loop that, that reoccurs, right? So setting the font. Uh, this little line is just looking at the frame counter value, and you know if I actually was running this instead of just displaying it, the hello world would be bouncing up and down because. I'm using this R to change the position of, of where Hello World is. Is it black on black? Uh, uh, okay, maybe this. I definitely should have chosen a different color here for background because that's uh, yeah, that's pretty dark. Um, and I don't have strokes. That, yeah, but it's not quite black on black. But it really does say Hello World right there. You can see it up here. See it perfectly clear on the screen. <laughs> um, Spoken like a true presenter. Yes. <laughs> I have crossed over. How many of the processing extra libraries are available for processing JS? Is the polymetric library available for? <laughs> I'm not familiar with that particular library. I'd say it's somewhere around 80% of processing is available in processing JS. Um, it's an open source project, and if you want to move the state of that forward, you know, the standard you know response there, right? Um, but. It's a pretty good chunk. I think for most of the stuff that you might ever run on a on like a on a Beagle board, uh, it's probably already there. Right? A lot of the, the more complex stuff for, or is missing today. Um, they do have a lot of 3D functions as well. Um, if yeah. you're all attending my talk tomorrow, the tentacle on the first slide was generated with processing. Ah, the octopus tentacle. Yeah, that one. <laughs> And then save this SDL and 3D printer. <laughs> and 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 printed on a, a MakerBot that it contains um, Arduino um, that was done with the processing language as well. Very meta. <laughs> Careful, they build a self-replicating robot. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> a self self-replicating octopus. <laughs> Um, anyway, so this, this language integrates rather easily with JavaScript. You know, you can use any JavaScript uh, syntax just directly within the, the processing JS. Um, much as I learned today, you can do with QML. Oh, that's a nice chart. Um, if we want to look at the code, I probably just um, walk through it. But let me let me do a demo first, actually, before spending too much time walking through the code. And I'll, I'll um, now let me actually let me, let me go here first. I'll, I'll do a walkthrough of the code just so that you understand it. But for those that aren't interested in the walkthrough of the code, I'll, I'll go ahead and hit the high points so that you can take off. Um, the, the 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 plans here. Um, so what I've got here is a scheme to, to you know capture data over Linux device drivers and, and feed that up over the network and and you know render that in a web browser, right? Um, but what I need is, is still is a lot more interfaces and the ways for, for these students um, to, to, to hack in and connect their iceberg C sensors, their you know, SPI gyros, their 
Um, you know, all the cool things that make em embedded really, really fun and, and interesting, right? When you start interfacing, interacting with the, with the real world. Um, so the Tin Can Tool Guys made this um, trainer XM board. This is it right here. Um, it just slides on to the, to the back of the BeagleBoard XM. Um, and it does a lot of things that make the, the IOs a lot more friendly um, for the hardware hackers. The, the BeagleBoard, um, I, I try to not have an expansion header at all, actually. I, I told Gerald, look, look, I don't want to support all this hardware stuff. I just want to have my, my phone you know, get something for the, uh, the Linux on that kernel developers that they can do some, some kernel development on, do some power management testing. Or just, just get it out there so the software people can, can, can move it ahead and run some, you know, get some real distro support and, and other things on the, the OMAP processor right now on Cortex A. Um, of course, Gerald is, a, um, Gerald, Gerald is a very talented engineer, very dedicated to supporting the community, and the hardware guys just could not be stopped. Um, much you know, to be expected of, of hardware guys. Question? Uh, well, no, more of a statement. Uh, I might point out that uh, there's a fairly large uh, community of uh, hobby roboticists and actually more professional roboticists who've been using things like BeagleBoard in their equipment, and if you hadn't gotten headers like that, they probably never would have. Yes, if, if the header wasn't there, the roboticists would have never shown up to the BeagleBoard, and, and um, and there are many, many of them, and they are um, absolutely fantastic to have in the community. Um, you know, ignoring the um, students that are constantly requesting boards um, to build their own next robot. Um, uh, you know, as a as a cool community project. Well, a one-off community project is not a community project. But that aside, the robotic stuff has been absolutely great. We've seen lots of progress around OpenCV. Um, <coughs> lots of lots of progress with. Uh, um, you know, we've got the people doing uh, libraries and stuff for, for controlling robots and, and, and doing, it seems like a lot of it's going on around Android, and I'm not quite, robots and Android, maybe it's just the word association, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, anyway, so the trainer board makes it a whole lot easier, and actually I think a lot of those robot guys will end up using something like this, you know, attached on to their, to their Beagle board, because it does a, a, a lot of things to make it friendlier. Um, for the hardware hackers, namely these 3.3 volt and 5 volt interfaces. Um, so there's a bunch of level shifters on here. And in mobile technology, right, it's, you know, we want to be the lowest power consumption possible. Um, but there's not a lot of, like, readily available components at 1.8 volts still, right? If you're going and purchasing stuff off of SparkFun, it's probably going to be 5 volt or 3.3 volt. Um, so you this may, brings you a bit more than there's a jumper to put the Atmega onto 5 volt, and then you can use the SPR on Atmega at 5 volt if you wish. So you're saying that you're suggesting that they make it SPI 5 volt, or it is, Dave? Uh, it's spec out for only 3.3, but there's a way that you can actually make it at 5 volts, but it's out of tolerance. Yeah, but you, I meant the SPI on the Atmega. Oh, right. Uh, he's they, saying go through the uh, Atmega. Atmet. Yeah, so if you do need 5 volts, you can go through the, the Atmel microcontroller on the board. That's why what's right here. Um, it, you can run that at 5 volts or 3.3 volts and have the I.O. for that to do SPI there. Um, and then you'll have the, um, the serial port that's connected up to the, um, the, the DM3730 or OMAP uh, processor uh, on an Eagle board. So you can do SPI at five volts. It's just not directly to the um, to the OMAP device. Um, good point. Um, and your GPIOs, and the same goes for the GPIOs. You can use the AtMega GPIOs to do five volts. Um, and there's also the AtMega. I mean, I just kind of left that the details of that whole little competitor's chip all off. Um, but uh, you know, there's A to D converters on there and and other. Other fun stuff, uh, and, and you can interface to that using the the, the, the standard tools that you use um, to talk to it from a from a desktop, right? You use AVR view. You can even run um, their little uh, Java um, based GUI, and I, I'll show you that. Um, I don't have it downloading the code yet. Um, you do have to, to to do a little quick hack that that Kuhn pointed out to replace the the, the binary serial drivers in, in Java. Um, that's pretty trivial. Um, the only thing that's really left is for, for um, the, the C library 
um, to um, that the C++ library to be friendly. Um, you know, when you when you compile your own uh, sketches, is what they call the applications. Um, so that should be. I don't know. I don't know what the state of that is, but that's that's going to be. It basically, basically works if you download the uh, Arduino environment. I think it's right 22. Extract it. Replace the native JavaScript libraries with the ARM one for the zero one. And then you just need to extract the AVR GCC, AVR libc, and AVR bin noodles. And then it just magically works. So when you compile the GC, so I've had problems when I do the compilation of the sketches that it tells me that the, there's something wrong with the, the C++ library. The, the serial one worked. The serial, oh, what is it, serial ASCII one. It compiled it, uploaded, and it started spitting out the zeros from the AVR back into the serial and it could read them back. So okay. maybe we tried a different example with the well, maybe, serial well, one. Maybe, uh, okay. maybe we can compile something. But this, is, this is the GUI right here. You see, this is the wiring language, and much like there's a draw language, there's a loop, um, and then there's just little simple um, you know, primitive functions for doing things like you know, GPIO toggling and, and, and delays. Um, and instead of, you know, as, a, as somebody who you know, programs in C all the time, the fact that you can't just do, you know, you know how hard is while one or you know, any sort of scheduling loop, I, I don't know, but uh, apparently this little loop function <coughs> Um, instead of being in main, but just a loop function that gets called in a loop is somehow making things easier for people who aren't familiar with programming. I'm not going to judge that. I just know lots of people use it. So if they can figure this out, 